father of creation, the Old Testament. He was the son of redemption in the New Testament, and he was the regenerating force in the church, the Holy Ghost. But you still have one God, three manifestations of that God, but only one God. Powerful. Above verse 9, right in there, John 17, verse 4 through 5. First John, I'm sorry, John 17, 4 through 5. In this setting, Jesus is praying. John 17, verses 4 through 5, and then also verse 11. Here, in verse 4 of John's Gospel, chapter 17, Jesus said, I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. He's praying. And now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. In other words, I put a little arrow off to the side of that verse and put plan of God. This had always been the plan of God. And then verse 11, Jesus continues, And now I am no more in the world, but these are in the world, and I come to thee, O Holy Father, Keep through thine own name those whom thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are. Underscore, be one as we are. And then, <clears throat> I've got it under verse 5 above that, but I put in there 1 John 5, 7. 1 John 5, 7. And turn to 1 John 5, 7. First John 5 and 7. Here, the Bible says, For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. Underscore that whole verse. And then under that verse, write in there John 10.30. John 10.30. And go back to the Gospel of John, chapter 10, verse 30. It takes a while to do this because I want you to have it chained reference in your Bible. John 10 and verse 30. Jesus simply said, I and my Father are one. Above that, write John 14, 9 through 10, and turn to John chapter 14. Nine through 10. <clears throat> Here, Jesus saith unto him, Have I been so long time with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. And how sayest thou then, showest the Father? Believest thou not that I am in the Father, and the Father in me? The word that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works." Under verse 10, write John 8, 58. John 8, 58. This particular setting, I mean, incensed the priest, the Pharisees, the Sadducees. It just threw them into absolute turmoil. Because here, they are questioning him. And in verse 54, Jesus answered, If I honor myself, my honor is nothing. It is my Father that honoreth me, of whom ye say that he is your God. 
Yet ye have not known him, but I know him. And if I should say, I know him not, I shall be a liar like unto you. But I know him and keep his saying. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. Now look at this. Then said the Jews unto him, Thou art not yet fifty years old, and hast thou seen Abraham? Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, or truly, truly, I say unto you, Before Abraham was, I am. They took up stones to cast at him. They were infuriated. How can he say, Before Abraham was, I am? Because he is the creator that said, Let there be light. Here, he's not far in a bush or an angel with Jacob or in a, a furnace like in the Son of Man. He is flesh, Emmanuel, God with us. But it's the same creator speaking here. <clears throat> then took they up stones to cast at him, but Jesus hid himself, went out of the temple, going through the midst of them, and so passed by. So under verse 58, write Hebrews 1 and 1, and go back to the book of Hebrews. Hebrews 1 and 1 says... God who at sundry times and in divers manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets. <clears throat> and that's talking about Jesus there, of course. Then if you go from there to 1 John 1.1, 1, 1, right above there, 1 John 1.1, 1, 1, and go back to 1 John 1.1, 1, 1, First John 1 John 1.1 says, That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled of the word of life. Who was it that they heard? Who was it they looked on? Who did they touch? It was Jesus. So here, <clears throat> go from there to 1 John 2.14, which says, I have written unto you, fathers, because ye have known him that is from the beginning. I have written unto you, young men, because ye are strong, and the word of God abideth in you, and ye have overcome the wicked one. Look at John, 1 John 5.20. It says here, And we know that the Son of God is come, and hath given us an understanding that we may know him that is true, and we are in him that is true, even in his Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. Then if you write in there, 1 John 3.16 Here it says, Hereby perceive we the love of God, because he, had, because he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. <clears throat> From there, I want you just to write under there, it would be good to write in there, Isaiah 43. And just very quickly, we're going to do some sketchy underscoring of verses in the book of Isaiah. And I think you'll like this. You have all of these notes in your notes in the, in the syllabus. So turn right Isaiah 43:10 and turn back to the book of Isaiah 43. We're picking up pieces of the puzzle all over the Bible. It's fascinating. Isaiah 43:10. And you're going to be underscoring uh, these verses because it's powerful. In other words, if you underscore things, then it will leap out at you when you look through it. Because it's impossible. Education is not how much you remember. Because you can't remember everything. Education is knowing where to go to find the answers when you need them. Hence the syllabus and all of this chain referencing. 
it will help you to know where to go and how to explain it. Here in verse 10, the Bible is saying, Isaiah speaking, Ye are my witnesses, saith the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, that ye may know and believe me and understand that I am he. This is God speaking, actually, Isaiah writing, or preaching in the streets, whatever. Here, I am he. Before me there was no God formed, underscore that, neither shall there be after me. And God goes on speaking, I, even I, in verse 11, am the Lord, and beside me there is no Savior. That's powerful, is it not? Then in 44, Isaiah 44, verse 6, Thus saith the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first, and I am the last, and beside me there is no God. Underscore, I am the first, and I am the last, and beside me there is no God. Well, Jesus made exactly the same statement. He said, I am the first and I am the last. You can't have two first and two last. They've got to be one and the same, and they are. Then if you look at verse 8, Fear ye not, neither be afraid. Have not I told thee from that time, and have declared it? Ye are even my witnesses. Is there a God, underscore this, is there a God beside me? Yea, there is no God. I know not any. Then go to Isaiah chapter 45. Can you imagine how often, how much Isaiah preached this? God spoke to him and he preached this. Isaiah 45, um, look at verse 5. Isaiah 45, verse 5. I am the Lord, and there is none else. Underscore all of this. There is no God beside me. I girded thee, thou that, though thou hast not known me, that they may know from the rising of the sun and from the west that there is none beside me. I am the Lord, and there is none else. Underscore that. Then look at verse 21. Look at the last part of verse 18. It says, I am the Lord and there is none else. Underscore that. Then go down to verse 21. Tell me and bring them near. Yea, let them take counsel together. Who hath declared this from ancient time? Who hath told it from that time? Have not I the Lord? And there is no God else beside me. A just God and a Savior. There is none beside me. Look unto me and be ye saved, all the ends of the earth. For I am God and there is none else. I have sworn by myself, the word has gone out of my mouth in righteousness and shall not return, that unto me every knee shall bow and every tongue shall swear. Jesus said exactly the same thing. Here you've got God in the Old Testament as the Spirit saying this. You've got Jesus, that same God in flesh, saying the same thing in the New Testament. And then in Isaiah 48, then you've got, you are double trouble for the devil because you can back him off. <clears throat> Here in Luke 135, the angel speaking here to Mary, and the angel answered and said unto her, the Holy Ghost, everyone say Holy Ghost, shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee, shall be called the Son of God. Under that, write Matthew 1.18, and turn to Matthew 1.18. Matthew 1.18 says, now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise, when as his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph, before they came together, underscore this, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Now in my area, I've talked to a lot of people about the oneness of God, and some received it and some rejected it. But I, I always presented this to them, because Trinitarians, and Basically, you need to understand this because it's really true. Basically speaking, the average Christian on the street believes in one God. 
they believe in Jesus. They believe that Jesus is God, basically. But it's the theologians that do all of the intricacies and uh, they go into all of the minute details. <clears throat> the Trinitarian doctrine is that there is a Father, Son, we'll do it this way. There is a, there is a Father, there is a, a Son, and there is a Holy Ghost. Three separate entities, co-equal, co-eternal from the beginning. That in itself is nonsense because of necessity a son is begotten of a father. A son cannot be co-equal, co-eternal with the father. It's ridiculous. But they believe there is a father, son, and Holy Ghost. Three separate entities, co-equal, co-eternal from the beginning. So I've said to them, if there is a Father, a Son, and a Holy Ghost, and the Bible says that Mary was found with child of the Holy Ghost, what right does this one have to claim the fathership? And they're confused. They say it's a mystery. Well, it's a mystery because it doesn't exist. I mean, Father, Son, Holy Ghost. The Bible says the Holy Ghost, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Then this one does not have the right to claim the fathership. And the only sense it could possibly make is that these are one and the same. Here's something else, not particularly part of this lesson, but I take delight in knowing this, okay? <clears throat> How is it, in the beginning, in the book of Genesis, everything reproduced after its own kind, everything seed was, it was in itself, and God saw that it was good. Everything, its seed was in itself, from fish, fowl kind, animal kind. Now, <clears throat> so you've got fish kind, you've got fowl kind, and you've got animal kind. And then you've got man. How is it nothing can breed out of its own kind? It's a law of genetics. There is nothing that can be done about it. For example, I grew up in Iowa. I used to detassel corn, hybrid corn in the summertime. The hybrid corn is a hybrid strain, but there is no viability within that hybrid strain in order to keep that corn hybrid, producing the extra big ears and innumerable grains of corn on each ear, they have to keep tampering with it in order to keep the hybrid strain. If you know anything about flowers or gardening and hybrid tea roses, hybrid tea roses are some of the most beautiful flowers in the whole world as far as I'm concerned, but the hybrid strain is grafted into the wild r rose root structure. If you don't know how to deal with, with hybrid tea roses, they will go back to the wild state. If you don't keep tampering with that hybrid corn and keep, keep that thing together, that strain, it'll go back to just the wild state or the wild corn before the hybridation took place, okay? Because there's a law in genetics, nothing can reproduce after its own kind. That being a law of God in creation, how is it that the Spirit of God could overshadow a virgin in the hillside country of now a Roman province called Judea, and with no man touching her, she could conceive? How is that true? How could that be? How is that possible? Because no species can breed out of its own kind. The reason that Mary could conceive by the overshadowing of the Spirit of God is she was not fish kind, not animal kind, not fowl kind. She was God kind, same species. That's how she could conceive. 
We are God kind. We are not animal kind. We are not fish kind. We are not fowl kind. We are God kind. I didn't evolve from some lower form of life. God himself shaped me into what I am and breathed into me the breath of life. And I am a living soul. Clap your hands for a moment. There's revelation here. There is understanding here. Hallelujah, Jesus. I worship you because you are God. Blessed be the name of Jesus forever. So let me ask you the, the, the great question. How many gods are there? You don't seem very positive about that. Say it again. One. Say it one more time. One. What is his name? Jesus. Shout that name for a moment. Jesus. And if I keep going, we'll have church, so I better keep teaching, okay? I can feel the presence of God among you people. Wonderful to feel the brush of angels' wings in this place, the touch of the Master's hand. God is in this place. So here, <clears throat> why don't you just um, lift your hands for a moment, and just we're coming to, to the, the end of this particular lesson. But once again, just ask God for revelation understanding to come into you, because something happened just a few minutes ago. I want that revelation of that same species to be a part of your life forever. Revelation understanding. God, that we will have so much to shout about. We have so much to dance about. We have so much to sing about. We have so much to preach about because of this revelation, this glorious understanding. Blessed be the name of Jesus forever. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah. So under that particular verse, 1 and 18, right in there, John 3, verses 34, John 3, 34, and then turn to John chapter 3. We could have church here tonight, couldn't we? Can you feel the presence of God? John 3 and 34. <clears throat> here in 34, the Bible says, For he whom God hath sent speaketh the words of God, for God giveth not the, the Spirit by measure unto him. Underscore, God giveth not the Spirit of measure unto him, meaning Jesus. The Spirit of God is given to us by measure. We have a measure of the Holy Ghost. But Jesus, the Spirit was given to him without measure. And there's a reason for that. Then under that verse, 34, write 1 Timothy 3, 16. 1 Timothy 3, 16. And turn to 1 Timothy 3, 16. First Timothy 3.16 says, Am I reading the C? I'm in Second Timothy, I'm sorry. First Timothy. Three sixteen. <clears throat> Underscore this whole verse. And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. It says the mystery of godliness, not the mystery of God. God was manifested in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. Who was received up into glory? Jesus. Under that verse, write Colossians 2.23. 2.23. 
2 and 9. Colossians 2 and 9. But while we're here, let's work also with Colossians 1 and 15. It's just a page in front of 2 9. Here, in Colossians 1 and 15, it says, Who, referring back to Jesus, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. Then verse 19, for it pleased the Father, or the Spirit, that in him should all fullness dwell. Wherever you see the word Father, you can insert temporarily insert the word Spirit, because that was the Father, that holy thing, that shall be born of thee. <clears throat> shall be called the Son of God, or the body of God. Powerful. For it pleased the Father, or the Spirit, that in him, Jesus, should all fullness dwell. Now, if you go from there to Colossians 2.9, this is, this is just powerfully, succinctly, simply stated. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Jesus was literally the fullness of God, the creator, because God was the Lo, I see four men loose walking in the midst of the fire, and they have no hurt, and the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. God himself stepped in that fiery furnace. So underscore, the fourth is like the Son of God. So God again manifests himself in a temporary manifestation of theophany. And when they brought them out of the fiery furnace, there was not even the smell of smoke on them. The hair was not even singed, and the ropes had been burned free. Nebuchadnezzar basically was converted because of that in the end result. Under this verse 25, write Romans 8 and 3. Well, before you go there, uh, let's do this. Under Daniel 3.25, write in there Exodus 3.2. And we won't particularly turn there right now, but God appeared to Moses as fire in a burning bush, and a voice spoke out of the fire. So there again, God appeared in theophany form. So we know that was a doctrinal thing. It was not an unusual thing for God to do this. How can we say that? How can we prove that? Because in the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be established. He did it four times here. We're talking about. <clears throat> but there, under that verse, Daniel 3.25, right in there, Exodus 3.2. But then also wrote, write Romans 8.3 and turn to Romans 8.3. Romans 8 and 3. Here the Bible says plainly in Romans 8 and 3, the apostle writing, For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin, condemns sin in the flesh. After that verse, write in their Hebrews 9.22.
Hebrews 9.22. Hebrews 9.22. Here in Hebrews 9 and 22, here is the crux of the whole matter. Here it says in 22, And almost all things are by the law purged with blood, and without shedding of blood is no remission. There's no remission of sins without the shedding of blood. So you need to underscore there, without shedding of blood is no remission. And then write under verse 22, Hebrews 2, 14 through 16. And turn back to the second chapter of the book of Hebrews and look at verses 14 and 16. <clears throat> are you beginning to understand something? I hope you are. Or that you will really understand this at the end of the, of the school sessions. Can you, can you see why some people do not find truth? You can't find what you don't want to find. You can't see what you don't want to see. If you just read carefully through the scriptures, as I said, the Bible reveals itself. It's the greatest commentary upon itself. If you can read a newspaper, I reiterate again tonight, you can read the Bible and understand. It's powerful. In fact, I think the most beautiful thing in the entire world is a hungry soul. Just give me a hungry soul and I'll help them get the Holy Ghost. If they're really hungry for God, it's tremendous. Look at verse 14 in Hebrews 2. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, underscore that, that much in that verse. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same. And verse 16 says, For verily or truly, he took not on him the nature of angels. In other words, he didn't become a spiritual creature, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. He became flesh. When the Messiah came, when God came into the world, he came in body, Emmanuel, not just uh, an ethereal, gossamer, angelic creature or form. The Bible says he took on him the seed of Abraham. So underscore all of verse 16. For truly he took not on him the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. And then right in there below or above that verse, Hebrews 10 and verse 5. Hebrews 10 and 5. And turn back to Hebrews 10 and 5. And as we're going through this, going back and forth through the scriptures, the Bible says, here a little, there a little, line upon line, precept upon precept. The Bible is like a gigantic jigsaw puzzle. If you just take a puzzle, no matter how beautiful the picture is on the front, take it home and dump it out on the table, where do you begin? But if you start working with the individual pieces, and just keep working with them, you'll find a piece here that fits this. And you'll find a piece over here that fits this. And you keep working with it, and the picture begins to form. And if you keep working with it, in the end, you will complete an incredible picture, just like on the cover of the box. This Bible is like a gigantic jigsaw puzzle. If you'll just begin to work with the pieces of the verses, all of a sudden, this fits here, and this fits here. And at the end result, God will give you a panoramic view of his dealing with mankind from Adam all the way through the timeline to the very end, when the last person that can be saved will be saved, and the last person that can be lost or will be lost is lost. 
That's why it's so vitally important to study the Bible and to work with the pieces. Are you getting a picture? It's tremendous. Now, here in Hebrews 10 and 5, look how, just look how obvious this is. Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, when who cometh into the world? Jesus. He saith, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body, underscore the word body, hast thou prepared me. A body hast thou prepared me. In other words, in the New Testament, wherever you see the word son, you can temporarily in your mind lift the word son out and put the word body in because that's really what it is. A body hast thou prepared for me. In other words, in that setting then, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten body that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. The picture becomes so clear, it becomes powerful, that God would have loved us to die for us. So after verse 5, put in there Acts 20 and 28, and turn back to Acts 20 and verse 28. Acts 20 and verse 28. Acts 20, verse 28. Here Paul is writing to the church, and he's saying here, take heed, in verse 28, Acts 20, 28, take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers, underscore this, to feed the church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood. It does not say which he purchased with the blood of a son, a second person of the Godhead. The Bible says here, which he purchased God, which he purchased with his own blood. Under that verse, right in there, <clears throat> Isaiah 9 and 6, And before you, you can turn there, and then I'll say something to you. Isaiah 9 and 6. I love this verse. I've always loved it. As long as I can remember. <clears throat> but back to Acts 20 and 28. The Bible says, The church, which he, which God, purchased with his own blood. If God so loved the world that he sent his son, a second person of the Godhead, to die, to be sacrificed for the sins of humanity, then the Creator instituted child sacrifice, which was a total abomination to God. Powerful. Isaiah 9 and 6 says, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. His name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Everyone say, Amen. Under Isaiah 9, 6, right in there, Luke 1, 35 and turn to Luke 1.35. The understanding of the oneness of God is the greatest understanding, as far as I'm concerned, that can come to a human being.
It's the greatest revelation, the greatest understanding that there is only one God. The devil doesn't care how many gods you serve, as long as you don't serve the one true God. That is the most fearful thing to him, because that's where the power is. And if you know the name of Adam's transgression, who is the figure of him that was to come. It is a very powerful, revelatory, insightful statement that will help you tremendously in the study of theology. Because when it says, even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression, Adam underscore Adam's, who refers back to Adam, who is the figure of him that was to come. So what the Bible is saying here, that Adam was the figure of him that was to come. Who was it that was to come? Jesus. So what the Bible is saying here, that when God bent low over the dust and the clay of the earth and shaped Adam, he shaped him into the image that he himself wanted to become. It's like an artist sitting across a room looking at a model and sculpting because what he's seeing, or an artist sitting here and a model here and painting what he is seeing. God did exactly the same thing. God, the creator himself, took the dust of the earth, clay, shaped it into an image, a likeness, that he himself wanted to become. It was just inanimated until the Creator bent lower and breathed into that clay image the breath of life, and man became a living soul. This is not particularly in this lesson, but it's interesting and noteworthy. If you understand what I just said, God bent over mud, earth, clay. That's one part. And he breathed into that clay image the breath of life, that spirit. And man became a living soul, that spirit. Man is two-thirds spirit. He's only one-third clay. That's why human beings, no matter who they are, what their background is, what their religion is, when they come into the presence of the one true God, the spiritual part of them recognizes the Creator. They can feel the reality of the one true God. And conviction begins to grip them. And they'll be either begin to weep, they'll begin to resist it, or they'll grip the back of a pew, or their hands will become wet, their heart will begin to pound, because the spiritual side of them recognizes the one true God who is a spirit. It's powerful. So here, God made Adam into that which he himself wanted to become when the hour arrived for him to come into the world, Emmanuel. So, near this verse, write Genesis 18.25 and then turn to Genesis 18.25. <clears throat> In the Old Testament, God was a spirit. A spirit does not have a form that you can see. So what God did in the Old Testament, he took on a temporary form or image so that man could see him. These temporary forms were called theophanies. They were only temporary manifestations of God. Temporary. Everyone say temporary. So here... <clears throat> In Genesis 18.25, when God was going to destroy uh, Sodom and Gomorrah, um, the Lord appeared to Abraham on the plains of Mamre 
And in verse 2 of chapter 18, and three men stood by him. One of those angels, one of those presentations or manifestations was God himself. And here's how to show it. Here's how to prove it. Two of them were angels, but one of them was God himself. Because if you look at verse 22, if you look at verse 17, Abraham bargained with God to save the city. Now you'll remember, in the beginning, when God chose Abraham, God instituted a blood covenant relationship with Abraham. In other words, God being a spirit had no blood. But he said, you take a heifer for me, and I'll give you the right and the covenant of circumcision which would be blood involved. In other words, God said to Abraham, you and I will mingle our blood together. We will enter into a blood covenant relationship. So Abraham became then, through an, a blood covenant relationship, an earth partner with the Creator himself. So now God is going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah and he warns Abraham. But if you look here, God made a promise that there would be a son born to them. And Abraham keeps, keeps dealing with him. How can Abraham keep bargaining with him if you find 50 righteous, will you spare the city? And he couldn't find 50, 40, 30, 20. It got all the way down. How can Abraham do something like that with God? Because he was an earth partner with God. And God will not break that, shall we say, legal bondage, that legal binding. So Abraham could bargain with God and persuade him to, to do what Abraham wanted to save those that could be saved. Verse 17, And the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham that thing which I do? <clears throat> Look at verse 22, And the men turned their faces from thence and went towards Sodom, but Abraham stood yet before the Lord, underscore the Lord there. One of those angels was God manifested in a theophany form, a temporal manifestation. Go down to 25. This is the clincher. That be far from thee to do after this manner, to slay the righteous with the wicked. Again, Abraham is bargaining with God. And that the righteous should be as the wicked. That be far from thee. See, Abraham is using words. And then he says to God, one of these angels that he sees, manifestations, shall not the judge of all the earth do right? The judge of all the earth is God himself. He addressed him as God. It was a theophany. And the Lord capitulated. This is what is interesting here about this. <clears throat> no matter how wicked... Singapore would become, no matter how vile Singapore might become, God forbid. But as long as Pastor Timothy is here, Bishop Willoughby is here, pleading for the souls of this nation, God will never destroy it. That's the kind of power we have. That's why it's so powerful to have a man of God as a pastor because he is a negotiator between this whole nation and the Creator Himself. Lift your hands and worship God for that. Utha Karisha Tarvika Shamaya Handola Varisha Taya Hallelujah Jesus. I thank you for God among us. I thank you for men of God with us, O oh God, in the name of Jesus. God with us, men of God among us, and vice versa. 
glory be to God. What a majestic plan. What a glorious stature that we find ourselves in. Blessed be the name of Jesus forever. Everyone say amen. Now from here, here's another theophany. Go to Genesis 32 and 24. Genesis, under that verse, I'm sorry, in Genesis 18.25, write uh, Genesis 32.24. And then go to Genesis chapter 32. Here again, God appears as in a theophany form, a temporary manifestation. In this setting, we have Jacob wrestling with an angel. <clears throat> that is no ordinary angel. If you look at verse 24 in chapter 32, it says, And Jacob was left alone, and there wrestled a man with him until the breaking of the day. Underscore the word Jacob there, and underscore uh, wrestled, and underscore until the breaking of the day. Jacob was wrestling with this angel. And the wrestling continued, and uh, the admonition was for Jacob to let go. And Jacob said, I will not let go. I will not let you go. I will not let you go. And Jacob, in verse 29, asked him and said, Tell me, I pray thee thy name. And he said, Wherefore is it that thou dost ask after my name? And he blessed him there. Jacob would not let go. And Jacob, in verse 30, here it is, and Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, for, underscore this, for I have seen God face to face, and my life is preserved. That was a miracle to Jacob. Here he wrestled with God himself in theophany form. Under that verse, write Daniel 3.25, and turn to the book of Daniel, chapter 3, and verse 25. Daniel chapter 3 and verse 25. The three Hebrew children in this setting were thrown into the fiery furnace because they would not bow to Nebuchadnezzar. At this point, the Hebrew children were in bondage in Babylon. <coughs> and we'll discuss that more in Daniel's 70th week. But here... When the three Hebrew children said to Nebuchadnezzar, Be it known unto thee, whether our God delivereth us, or, delivereth us or not, we will not bow down to thee nor thy image. So Nebuchadnezzar commanded that they heat the furnace seven times hotter, as I recall here, and threw in Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego. <clears throat> Verse 25, he answered and said, Good, let's try it from the top down. Shema Israel, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad. Now, if I go slowly, will you try to stay with me? Okay. Shema Israel, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad. Again. Shema Israel Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad. Very good. The next verse is difficult. Ve'ahavta et Adonai Elochecha, behold, levavha uvahol nafshacha, uvahol me'odacha. That's much more difficult, but it says, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy might. But I won't, I won't labor you with that one. We'll just stick with the Shema. Shema means hearken to, hear, is what it means. So when it begins, it's saying, hearken, Israel, hear, Israel, listen to. That's what the Shema is all about, that there is only one God, and it is a mainstream truth. So in this particular lesson, you must have a major anchor. So we will go to the 
major mainstream truth. The major mainstream truth begins here about the oneness of God in Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 4. Deuteronomy 6 and 4. <clears throat> And what we're going to do is tonight, we're going to chain reference all of these scriptures through your Bible. So if you can remember Deuteronomy 6.4, then under every verse thereafter, it will tell you the next verse to go to. So if you're in public witnessing to someone and you've got your Bible, you can just remember Deuteronomy 6.4, you can just go through the entire Bible, just proving one verse after another, the oneness. They'll think you're brilliant. Just tip your Bible so they don't see that the writings you've got under the verses. <clears throat> I, I am delighted to, uh, to do all of this. Do you like this? Thank God. So here in Deuteron Deuteronomy 6 and 4, <clears throat> the Bible says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Underscore that. And under that verse, write, Deuteronomy 32, 39. And then turn to Deuteronomy 32 and 29, or This verse says here, See now that I, even I, am he, and there is no God with me. I kill and I make alive, I wound and I heal. Neither is there any that can deliver out of my hand. Under that verse, right in there, Luke 10.22. Luke 10.22. And then turn in your Bible to Luke chapter 10 and verse 22. There's a very interesting statement made here. In Luke 10, 22, Jesus is speaking. He says, All things are delivered to me of my Father, and no man knoweth who the Son is but the Father, and who the Father is but the Son, and to, and to whom the Son will reveal him. Put a circle around the word reveal. And who the Father is but the Son, and he to whom the Son will reveal him. Right under that verse, Matthew 11:27, and turn to Matthew 11:27. Matthew 11:27 says, <clears throat> And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence, and the violent take it by force. Uh, I'm sorry. 11:27. That's 12. <clears throat> All things are delivered unto me of my Father, and no man knoweth the Son but the Father. Neither knoweth any man the Father save the Son, and he to whomsoever the Son will reveal him. Remember I taught you last night in the, in the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be established. Here are two verses, very interestingly, that say exactly the same thing. It's really a revelation. It's something that God helps you to understand. Powerful. Next to verse 27, write John 4 and 24. John 4, 24, and turn to the Gospel of John, chapter 4 and 24. John 4.24 says, <clears throat> Jesus speaking, God is a spirit. Everyone say spirit. 
and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Right under that verse, Genesis 1, 2. And turn to the book of Genesis, chapter 1, and verse 2. <clears throat> the Bible says here in the Gospel of John, Jesus speaking, that God is a spirit. That is confirmed again here in Genesis 1, 2. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God... Everyone say, Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. Under that particular verse 2, write Genesis 1, 26, and then go to verse 26. Here, <clears throat> in verse 26, and God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, over the cattle, over the earth, etc., etc. Now, in this verse of scripture, when God said, let us make man in our image, the Trinity world tries to say that God there is Elohim, which is the plurality of God's sum total assets and powers. So they try to say that's proof that uh, there's more than one in the Godhead. That's not what the, what the scripture is saying here. When God said, and let us make man in our image, he is speaking in what is called the plural of majesty. In other words, he was speaking in the sum total of his power and assets. This has been done for centuries and centuries by sovereigns all over the world. Queen Elizabeth, when she addresses the nation, speaks in the pearl of majesty. She uses the pearl form, we, us. But she's really speaking for self and alone. The king of Thailand also does this, even in this hour. He speaks, when he speaks to the nation, he speaks in the pearl of majesty, using us and we. But he's really speaking as a single sovereign entity. So it's what grammarians call the pearl of majesty. God here was speaking in the sum total of his power and assets. To prove that, if you go now to the next verse, <clears throat> even though he says, let us make man in our own image in verse 26, in verse 27, look at this, underscore this. So God created man in his, not their image, but his, it's singular. Put a circle around his image, and in the image of God created he, not they, he, put a circle around the word he, him, male and female created he, put a circle around he, them. Then if you go to verse 29, and God said, behold, I, not we, I, put a circle around the word I, have given you every herb bearing seed, etc. Then in verse 30, Toward the end of that verse, he says, I have given every green herb for meat, and it was so. Put a circle around the word I there. Then if you look at verse 31, and God saw everything that he, not they, he, put a circle around the word he had made, and behold, it was very good, and the evening and the morning were the sixth day. Uh, and then verse 2 of chapter 2, and on the seventh day God ended his work, his work, not their work, which he, not they, had made, and he rested, not they rested. Then if you look at um, verse 8 in chapter 2, and the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he, put a circle around the word he, put the man whom he, singular, had formed. So even though... God in verse 26 speaks in the sum total of his power and assets, the pearl of majesty, and uses the pearl form us. In every instance thereafter, it is singular because there is only one God. Under verse 26, then write Malachi 2.10. Malachi 2.10. 2 it's one of the minor prophets. 
Go to the book of Malachi 2.10. Once you study this thoroughly and get all of these things in your heart, it makes you very confident of who you are and what you have. And you don't feel intimidated by anyone else. And even if they reject what you're saying, the fact that you know it's true, you just have to understand this gospel only works on the hungry and the thirsty. It was never never designed for the mocker nor the, nor the scoffer. It doesn't work on mockers and scoffers. It only works on the hungry and the thirsty. That's why you and I are here today. We were hungry for the things of God. We were thirsty for the things of God. And God filled us. Here in Malachi 2.10, here the prophet is saying, Have we not all one Father? Hath not one God created us? underscore in that verse, one Father and one God. And then, under verse 10, write in there Romans 5, 14. Am I going too fast? Are you keeping up? I'll slow down just a bit. <clears throat> under verse 10, write Romans 5, 14. And then turn to Romans 5, 14. This verse of Scripture is just a tremendous understanding. I became so excited when I first saw this and understood it. Here, <clears throat> Paul is writing to the church in Rome, and he says in Romans 5.14, Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned after the and 12. Hearken unto me, O Jacob, and Israel my called. I am he. I am the first. I also am the last. There it is again. And then from there go to Isaiah 52 and 6. And we're almost finished. 52 and 6. Therefore my people shall know my name. Therefore they shall know in that day that I am he that doth speak. Behold, it is I. And you could write in there Matthew 1 and 21. And that verse goes back to say, Matthew 1 and 21 says, And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, and he shall save his people from their sins. Lesson concluded with this final understanding. <clears throat> this Jesus, he is the permanent flesh manifestation of the Creator. That flesh will never leave him. When he appeared in theophany form in the Old Testament, it was only temporary. An angel in the fire, a voice out of the burning bush, etc., as we've discussed. But when Jesus came, it was a fusion of omnipotence and deity with human frailty. And his name shall be called Emmanuel, God with us in the flesh. The world had never had that before. Never. I made a little drawing for you here tonight to sort of it's my own little parabolic understanding. But a picture's worth a thousand words. I don't know how it is here in Singapore, but in America, I know how it is. I'm sure it's true here. I just haven't looked for it that much. But in the United States, all along the highways in the country and nearest cities, there will be high lines, electrical high lines running. And in certain areas, there will be a big sign that says, danger, high voltage. In other words, you don't go near that area because the voltage is very high. And what would happen is, if here's a house in the countryside, if they ran a wire directly from this high voltage, into this house, it would blow the house up. 
So what they do is they set a pole outside in the yard, outside the house. They run the high voltage to this pole, but they hang a transformer on the pole, which reduces the voltage down. So the reduced voltage can go into the house, and they have electricity, and the house is not blown up. If God had come into this world with his glorified body, he was high voltage danger. People would have melted in his presence. The only place that nearly happened was in the Garden of Gethsemane when they cried out, Who are you? And Jesus said, I am he. And it's just that his statement caused those soldiers to fall back like dead men on the ground. In other words, he pulled back that robe of flesh and for just a flesh that glory came out when he said, I am he. So, Jesus, if he had come, as I said, we would have been disintegrated. But, Jesus, on a cross, became our transformer. That power of God, that glory, that high voltage, channeled through him, reduced the voltage so that we could touch him, look in his face, hear his words, see him, Jesus is our transformer. He made this possible for us to touch him. And when we shall see him, it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when we shall see him, we shall see him and be like him. Tremendous.